Welcome to Waiting on the Trade, a monthly comics book club for people who can't keep up with monthly comics. I'm Matt Ledger. I'm Patrick Fitzgerald Fleck. And I'm Bryce Manning. This month, we're talking about X-Men God Loves, Man Kills by writer Chris Claremont and artist Brent Anderson. Now, in case you all need a refresher, God Loves, Man Kills is the seminal X-Men story and has set the stage for most every X, X book that has come after it. I'm going to trip over the word, the letter X so many times in this podcast, you guys. This podcast brought to you by the letter X. <laughs> <laughs> God Loves Man Kills is also the major source of inspiration for X2, which is, in my opinion, the best of the X-Men movies. Pat, disagree. I uh, I might. Yeah, <laughs> X2 is the best. No, take it back. Take it all back. Logan's the best X-Men film. Well, okay. Oh, yeah. oh my Logan's gosh. Right. I haven't seen yeah. Logan yet. Oh, you need to see Logan. Because it was described to me on New Zealand radio, and I feel like I've seen it. Oh, yes, I remember this now. But you should still see it. It's real good. Before we devolve into a fight about X-Men movies, Bryce, welcome back. Oh, thank you. Good to be back. You're back, Bryce. We missed you. Yeah. What have you been up to since the last time you were on the podcast? Uh, my usual shenanigans. Watching anime, mostly. Yes. How many cups of coffee have you served in the time between oh, now and then? God, too many. Fair. <laughs> Where do you guys want to start with this one? Like, I honestly feel like it is kind of the X-Men book. Like... If I was going to hand someone an X-Men book, this is probably the one I'd give them at this point. And that's saying a lot, considering I hadn't read this comic till four days ago. <laughs> I like a lot of other X-Men books, and I feel like if someone was like, what are the X-Men about? This is the one I'd give them. Mm, maybe. I'm not as, like, Bryce is the the true... The true fan? X -Men. Yeah. Like, <laughs> the one who's I'm hailing comparison. The X-Men? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, actually, I really agree with Matt. Because... Okay. Uh, I mean, the intro is pretty uh, self-explanatory in, like, what this uh, book's going to be about. You know, the first few pages. There are actually, like, so many good choices in that intro that yeah. I feel like if you don't think about, like, if you don't think about it, you just be like, oh, hey, the story's coming along. But, like, there are conscious choices where it's like, I'm pretty sure those, like, those children are black children on purpose so that you identify with them that way before you even find out that they're mutants. I'm pretty sure that, like the choice to open on Magneto as the protagonist right away is also a conscious choice and kind of tells you like what this story's like how this story's going to go like Magneto is a hero from like page 2 of this book. I felt like it was slightly over like very blatant starting with the death of two black children who were basically lynched in the beginning. But like that's the analogy, Pat. Like that's the whole that's I the book. know, but like <laughs> subtlety is not found anywhere in this entire well, it's a Chris Claremont book, Pat. I think it's actually, it is like, I mean, Magneto's like chewing the scenery in these few pages. Right Magneto's front, right? fine. Like, it's just, it's the lynching of two young black children. And then it jumps to a scene where Kitty Pride uses the N word to get her point across. So I think part of that is the book wants you to know what you're in for right away. Like this isn't going to be fun, lighthearted superhero. It's not X-Men versus aliens, right? Like this is like, this is the human X-Men book that presents their problem in like the most, maybe not the most real world way possible. I mean, Magneto crashes through the UN in this book, but he put the ceiling back. He's just making an entrance. <laughs> that's such a, that's such a, like, I could feel the rewriting happening in that. Like, it's like, oh, he crashed through the ceiling, but like, it's not put back together. I have to explain why there's no hole in the ceiling. <laughs> Senator, we have to get out of here. Calm down. He put it back. He put it back. <laughs> but yeah, I don't, you guys get into it. I don't want to, I don't want to rain on the parade. If you think it's ham-fisted, you, you think it's ham-fisted, like. The choice to make them black was obviously a choice. And I don't think it was a necessary one. Like they could have been not black. I mean, sure. They could have been, I, I think making the children a minority starts speaking to the, like the X-Men allegory before you even find out the children are mutants though. Like. Because the, to like the to this white lady hunting these children, like these children are others, regardless of whether they're mutants. I think I think it's supposed to draw you in that way. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it just it feels two dimensional to me. It feels like it could have been more by not playing into that. I don't know. That's just me thinking. I mean, I think I think it kind of ha doesn't have to lean into it, uh, obviously, but like I think it gains something by leaning into that but we can agree to disagree. It, it certainly gets the point across right from like page one. So in that case, yes, it, it 
did what it set out to do. Well, I mean, here's the thing is like, do you think most readers of the X-Men comic books, at least in the eighties anyways, were people of, of color? Cause, uh, in 1975, that's when they introduced a more diverse cast of the X-Men. Like each per each member of the X-Men came from like different country or a different like ethnic group as opposed to being like an all white team. And so I'm wondering if the use of like people of color here in the beginning is already just speaking to the audience sure. that they had at the time. Like more people of color or or minorities like LGBT people like were reading the X-Men anyways. Yeah, I guess I'm not taking the historical context of when this book was published. So sure. I could see that. Yeah, and like in the in the back matter interviews, Claremont talks about how even using the N word was supercharged for him. Like like he thought about that choice and like a part of the reason they were able to do that was because this was like an outside of continuity graphic novel book. Like it wasn't part of the main X-Men line. He was talking Mm -hmm. about how like the books could be quote unquote adult. And for a lot of people that means like, oh, you can put TNA in it, blah, blah, blah. But like he wanted to use that to actually explore some space that you might not be able to get into in the normal X-Men comic. Yeah. Mature topics. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. So that's part of like, I think that's part of why some of the choices are made the way they are. Sure. But aside from that, I think the intro does a really good job of uh, grabbing the reader and basically informing them this is what, hey, this is what this is going to be about. Uh, you got some mysterious new enemies here known as the Purifiers. Never, They've never appeared before. What a name, by the way. And then Magneto, who is like often billed as the bad guy, is uh, actually kind of sympathetic. Bryce, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there a better feeling as an X-Men fan than being able to root for Magneto? <laughs> uh, Magne- I, 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 I really <laughs> love Magneto. I, I like it when he's, I don't know, I just, I just like him in general, I guess. Well, as like a stereotypical villain, but then at the times when he's like trying to be a good guy and trying to do something similar to what Charles Xavier's dream is. Right, like at least, like in a good Magneto interpretation, you at least see where that guy's coming from, yeah. even if you don't agree with what he's doing. Yeah. Like the comparison I've always heard is Xavier is Martin Luther King, Magneto is Malcolm mm-hmm. X. Yeah, I've heard that one too. I'm not sure how like consciously true that is or isn't. Maybe I'll see if I can dig something up for the show notes because Chris Claremont's done a lot of interviews. Turns out that guy has been writing comics for a long time. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> like, yeah, all the big X-Men thing is coming from him, basically, right? Mm-hmm. Got the Dark Phoenix saga. Well, Days yeah, he was in charge from 1975 to like 1991. Yeah, 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 that's a lot of comics. He's the one that basically shaped the X Men into being more of like a a soap opera rather than uh, you know just here's a team of superheroes saving the yeah, world like over the and over again. We know them today. Yeah, don't exist without without the Claremont take mm-hmm. for sure. Like I used to read um, the Elkhorn Library had a bunch of like the essential X Men volumes of the Claremont run, so that's where I like first like first picked up his stuff. That's where I first became Kitty Pride fan for life. I mean, Ariel, I think is her name. We don't talk about that code name, Pat. <laughs> Swear to God, it was the third reread before I realized, oh, that's Kitty they're talking right. about. Pat, do you have a preferred Kitty Pride code name? Uh, those are the only two I know. Well, Shadowcat, right? Yeah. Bryce, do you have a preferred Kitty Pride code code name? No, I just call her Kitty. I like Shadowcat. This week's this week's new X Men comics were Kitty Pride is Captain Kate Pride. She's now Captain Kate Pride. <laughs> I've never been a Kitty Pride fan. Oh, why? Why though? Like, I I don't like hate her as a character. Like, I'm glad she's there, <laughs> but I don't know. She's just never done anything for me. Oh, hmm. okay, Bryce. Who is your favorite X Men, and are they in this book? Uh, my favorite would have to probably be Storm, and yes, she is in this book, but she does absolutely nothing. She doesn't. She get gets a lot angry do, yeah. and makes a lightning bolt go off. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Storm's one of my favorites. Uh, being a 90s kid, Jubilee's one of my favorites. Jubilee's pretty great. Jubilee's I've, awesome. I've always been partial to Nightcrawler myself. Nightcrawler's pretty cool. This is a good Nightcrawler yeah. book. Like, he doesn't get a lot to do, but it's a good Nightcrawler book. Yeah. yeah. And in the cartoon, I had a big crush on Gambit. <laughs> Who didn't, Bryce? <laughs> right. I know. Who didn't? <laughs> He's such a slime ball, though, Bryce. Uh, it's just my type. Oh, Bryce. He's a bad boy. You could do better. <laughs> so yeah, William Stryker, he's leading those purifiers on their mission of purification. They're still they're still relevant mission. Which I'm well, yeah, we talked about the fact that Magneto, the superpowered 
arch villain isn't the villain of this novel. No, it's a it's, different white man with white hair. <laughs> yeah, it's a preacher. Who, unlike the X2 movie, has nothing to do with, uh, or, yeah, has nothing Wolverine. to do with the military. Or Wolverine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so we like jump into his office and it's already clear that he's uh, definitely spying, at least on the X-Mansion or on the X-Men. He has already, he's gotten like files that are have been leaked by a contact in the FBI yeah, or something yeah. like that. And he's already like plotting to take them out. He knows they're, they're trouble. Like they're the, they're the poster children of, of mutants. He's got to take them down. I don't like him, you guys. You're not supposed to like him, man. <laughs> no, I know. It's just like, I'm looking at this like. Are those the X-Men? They certainly are, but God willing, if all goes well, not for very... Like, they haven't done anything to him. They did nothing to him. Leave them. Leave those X-Men alone. It's just an irrational fear of something you don't understand. So in the in that same, like, Back Manor interview, Claremont's talking about how, like, when he wrote this, he was hoping that, like, eventually it would not be relevant. <laughs> like, eventually the story would mm-hmm. not make sense to people. Haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, we're not there yet, right? <laughs> like, Yeah, yeah, I think he said something like... Uh, we hope the story is like maybe relevant for the next five, ten years, and it's like what thirty yeah, years. Yeah, and it's like I'm looking at this panel of the TV like switchboard operators, like talking about how Stryker knows how to play the television and like play to his audience. He comes across as such a well n- nice, personable guy. Like, uh, ooh, don't like. Well, Trump does not come across as a nice, personable guy. Personable, I think maybe <laughs> some people think nice. Ugh. I would contest. <laughs> Well, Stryker is like a mix of like, I don't know, Jerry Falwell and like Trump. Sure. Yeah. You know, he's got like the charisma and uh, is able to play off of his audience's, uh, I guess, fears and uh, basically amplify them to do whatever he wants them to do. Are you guys surprised by how many people in this comic said that guy scares me? Because <laughs> I was actually. All like the normal people, like yeah, even the TV operator guy is like saying here because the man's message is pretty damn scary. And like later, the cops are like, "Ugh, I wish this guy would stop talking." Like, there's so many people in this book that are like the voice of reason, and I feel like we've lost that in the last thirty years. <laughs> Where did these people go? I don't even like. Uh, yeah, it's a dark time, man. You can let it out, Pat. This is the one where we get to talk about it, because I don't know how we don't talk about it on this one. Usually, if we get into politics stuff, we try to skirt around it, right? But, like, it's the X-Men, and it's God Love Man, God Loves Man Kills. And, like, there's no way to not talk politics in this one, because the book is politics. This dude tries to kill Cyclops and Storm and throw their body in an incinerator. And I don't know how you don't talk about the politics on this one. He tries to kill Storm and Cyclops via Xavier. Mm-hmm. He breaks Xavier, like, in multiple ways. Well, almost. I mean, he keeps Storm and Cyclops barely alive. The real break is the thing that Pat, like, texted me about, where he's like, yeah, Xavier was going to join Magneto. How messed up is that? It's like, he almost joins Magneto, and Cyclops like, no, don't do that. It's like, you're right, I shouldn't. But hey, in the current X-Men storyline, they are allies. Yeah, and it's not just them. It's like them and Apocalypse and Mr. It's all mutants. (laughs) Yeah, it's everyone. Which I, I definitely want to read that. Oh, it's very good. I feel like, honestly, we should do... Because we don't have this episode currently slotted into the release schedule, right? I feel like we should do this one, and we should do House of X, Powers of X, just back-to-back. Because there is such a direct would be correlation down. between this book, where the like the threat is real, but it's not quite enough to force... It's not quite enough to force these divergent mutant philosophies together into one thing that has to counteract the threat. Like, there's still... a point where cyclops is the one who says hey no we can like we can do this xavier's way like the dream isn't dead we can we can make it and basically house of x powers of x is like the dream fails 11 times and i'm here to tell you from the future that we need to change it (laughs) we need a new dream we need a bigger (laughs) dream so yeah like it's it's really interesting to have read this right now like right like coming off of house of x and powers of x because there's a lot of stuff that that echoes forward and I think gets extrapolated out into not like not the mutants giving up on the dream, but realize like realizing like they have to they have to change it because it's been 35 years since God Loves Man mm. Kills came out. And no one's gotten it yet. <laughs> All right. So we jump back to the plot. Well, let's jump to the like the first quote unquote controversial thing. Uh, Kitty Pride's use of the uh, N word. How do you guys feel about that? Like, I don't think that would definitely get published in a book today. 
I was wondering about that actually. I'd written that in my notes. Like, do you do you think you could publish that in a book today? I don't think you can. I think Twitter just yeah. take you down. Although the yeah. context of it like makes sense, like how like when Kitty says it, like it's not like Kitty's saying the like saying the word in a derogatory sense, right? She's saying it like She's yeah, using like it to what make if point. like what if he had said this? Mm-hmm. And her dance teacher is like, yeah, that would have actually been terrible and kitty's right because yeah, basically the dance teacher is like oh you know you should just shrug it off it's like no big deal it's just words but then because she doesn't she is not a mutant the dance teacher she's not as affected by the word muty as kitty pride is so then she makes the point with the n-word and then the dance teacher realizes, you know yeah language is powered it hurts i love K- kitty as a point of view character in the x-men books like Kitty Pride is one of the b- the best like audience identification characters I think ever created. So to see her just rate like rage off on this guy because he's been doing this for like weeks or months or whatever it seems like. Like I feel for yeah, her. Yeah, and she she's still pretty new to the team. Like I think she's still kind of a teenager. But she's still going through a coming of age um, in this story arc. I'm gonna assume she's roughly 18. <laughs> this is what I'm gonna go with, even yeah. though that might be wrong. Based on some of the stuff she says to Ileana later. <laughs> yeah, 14 or 15, but... Also, she's Jewish. Did we bring that up? No, we didn't. But, I mean, that's another one of those <laughs> yeah, things that's like, she's Jewish. wearing a Star David necklace while she's punching this guy, so... I get what the comic book is going for, it, but... Uh, I don't know. I'm with you, Bryce, all the way. But, like, the dance teacher, like zoom in and her like single tear reminds me of the native American. Yeah. Yeah. Littering. <laughs> yeah. I know what you're talking about. Like, uh, okay. I gotcha. But good Lord. Pat, what do you think the oldest comic you've read is? <laughs> I'm just, I, have uh, a, I have a point. <laughs> okay. Off the top of my head. I'm not really sure. Let's go with this one. Okay, see that that might be it because like I've read a bunch of comics that are much more stilted and like ham fisted than this. Well, that's fine, but I'm not. I'm reviewing this comic. I'm not no, reviewing I know. It in context of all other comics. No, I'm trying to figure out why for like why for you it's it's too much, and for me uh, it wasn't. Like I'm just trying to figure out the difference, and I'm wondering if maybe it's that. I don't know. I enjoy graphic novels, and I think they can convey a message as strong or stronger than any other form of media using such blatant tactics to get their message across is i prefer more nuanced approach than this and that might be too much to ask for a 70s x-men comic but it felt heavy hand at least this beginning part but how do you feel about nightcrawler's polo (laughs) (laughs) that's on the next page nightcrawler's wearing a polo how do you feel about that, that though i'm all for that absolutely Kurt works that polo. He does. I was like, if anything's like, if anything makes a mutant more human than wearing a badly colored polo, I don't know what does. I will say the one thing that I think, like, I think honestly the book's really good, but the one thing I thought didn't quite work was the danger room sequence, actually. Oh, really? I thought I enjoyed that one. See, I enjoyed it, but I think like Brent Anderson's strengths in the art definitely play to the more the more real world stuff that's in the book and so when you get to the mm-hmm. danger room it just looks like a bunch of it looks like a bunch of people in a, in a metal box which i mean it kind of is but like i don't know like even the next like the next action sequence out like out in the the real world where xavier the and scott goods. like get ambushed that's really good yeah. and like that like the coloring and the like all the angles and stuff and the danger room sequence to me is just like so like there's barely any backgrounds. But I think it's supposed to be that way. Like the danger room is a fake danger, and in the next page it's actual danger from actual sources of oh, that's people a, who want to kill people. That's a good take, actually. I hadn't thought of that. Like, because yeah, there's just like that really menacing looking assault rifle like pointed at yeah. Scott. And I'm just like terrified for that, my my favorite X-Man boy. <laughs> It's a it's a poor choice, but I'm with you, I guess. <laughs> this is a really good Cyclops book, actually. Mm, yeah, okay. Yeah, Cyclops has his moments. The whole Cyclops rules the end of this book. Yeah. Well, I mean, like in, as a character in general. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, it's fair. Also agreed. 
that one panel of Wolverine trying to jimmy the lock open with a claw with his tongue out. Right. Perfect. Yeah. It's good. It's real good. <laughs> Does Peter's sister not have any mutant powers? Is she didn't normally? Uh, not at. Well, I mean, maybe she has like some latent ones at this point. But that's a whole deal. She be, actually, she become, yeah, she becomes magic. Not magic as magic in is? well, yes, not magic in that she learned spells, but also magic in that like that's her name. <laughs> yeah, with a K. Oh no! Oh, and man. then she also becomes like the queen of some sort of demon dimension. She lives in hell. Of course, for a she while. does. <laughs> Oh, yeah. you know. And then comes back and she's aged up. It's weird <laughs> X-Men stuff. Yeah, it's very timey wimey. Yeah, but yeah, at, at this point, at this point in the story, she's just a normal kid, I think. Because when I started to read it, I thought, oh, that new chick, she's Ariel, and that's Kitty Pride, who they didn't introduce for some reason. I couldn't figure out who Ileana was for a little bit too, just because like she didn't have powers in this book, and I'm used to her having powers. So I was like, oh wait, no, <laughs> that's that's Ileana, that's magic. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, they do they do a danger room sequence, which is, you know. Not that dangerous. Meanwhile, in the real world, real dangerous things are happening. <laughs> Xavier, Storm, and Cyclops get, get blown up and shot, maybe. I mean they're stunned or whatever. <laughs> That's a pretty clean like operation. Just knock the car over, shoot, 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 and then grab them and make it look like an accident and run. Like in one page, they take out three leaders of the X Men. <laughs> yeah, it's a very clean military like operation. Do you see the size of Stryker's like skyscraper for his cult? <laughs> like they got they got some funds. I mean, he's just got a floor in that building. Pat, come! Oh no, it's the Stryker building. Never mind, you're right. <laughs> it's the Stryker that. building. It's he's got to compensate for something. Well, at least it doesn't say Stryker on the outside. <laughs> it's got three letters. X's on it. I'm like, yeah. Why would he put X's on it? <laughs> he unwittingly identifies with the mutants. It's what it is. It's what it is. So the X-Men investigate. Colossus rips an engine out of a car. That engine is mm. drawn fantastically. <laughs> it's real good. Oh yeah, and then Magneto steps in and we get like my favorite sequence, which is <laughs> Wolverine is the good cop and Magneto is the bad cop. They torture that guy real good, right? They do like, do that, them. yes. <laughs> like Magneto is torturing people and maybe killing them i don't know i don't think he killed anyone what do you guys think he's doing there is he like moving the metal in and out of their body or because that i couldn't tell other than he's just using his powers kind of looking at it again because like there's something they're all wrapped in metal so that's the metal yeah there's definitely something surrounding the guy's fingers He's not having a good time, whatever's happening. Definitely not. And like Magneto apparently has the power to shoot electricity in this one too. So Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I think that dude's getting electrified yeah. at the same time. You know, he can act like a defibrillator. Yeah. Defibrillator? Whatever those yeah. things are called. Which sort of makes sense. That's how magnets work, right? I guess. Right. Yeah, right. Sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, I do know I do know he can he can absorb electricity and uh lightning strikes because storm has no effect on him. Sure. Bryce, you nerd. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Uh, But yeah, like Nightcrawler says something about it. But if we use our foes' methods, are we any better than them? So their methods is killing people. Did they kill someone? Did they kill those people? Well, they're getting closer. They're torturing. That dude? No, I don't think they killed him. I think they did torture him real good, like Bryce was saying. No. Okay. All right. Sort of crippled. That's all. It's like we're getting really close to this line. I mean, Nightcrawler then goes on to like dance up to the line himself later, which I think kind of shows you how, like, how precarious yeah. the situation is when he's. Does he? He he fake threatens to kill that dude. Yeah, but do you think he actually was going to? Oh hell no, Nightcrawler! Nightcrawler's not going to kill anybody. <laughs> also, I sort of think it's lame that Nightcrawler's like. Is the fear of people have of what Nightcrawler will do to them is bite them. It's like, come on. He's got sharp fangs, come man. Yeah. yeah, but he could also like do something with teleportation. Not everyone could, knows like, that. Teleport. Like teleport you into a volcano. Yeah, like spliff you into a wall or something. I don't know. Yeah. Good use of the split. Yeah. <laughs> it's bamf. Yeah, one of those things. But like, yeah, even in like Xavier's nightmare, all he does is rip out his neck. It's like, come on, Nightcrawler can do cooler things than that, Xavier. 
Use I'm going to teleport to you and Use your imagination, you. Charles, when you picture Even how Xavier's your students like, torture you. That's all he can really do. <laughs> Fuck you, Xavier. I actually found that sequence pretty terrifying. I think, honestly, because the Twin Towers are in it, like, very prominently. Ooh, I didn't catch that. Oh, good point. I don't know. It's still jarring to see them in things, honestly. Especially this one. <laughs> Kitty gets to rip out his heart. Wolverine gets to eviscerate him. Storm gets to fry him. Nightcrawler bites his neck. Cy- Cyclops gets to drown him in some sort of like my psychic, ass, psychic nice. swamp. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I hate when my uh, Cyclops is secret rays power. <laughs> get all my ads, money. And then, uh, yeah, Striker appears like as a heavenly figure. Yeah, and get, get into that Striker's motivation. He had a mutant, a mutant child. All right, Pat. Going going back to the heavy handedness. Okay. Do you guys think? Yeah. Striker would have been a better villain, especially in this story, if he didn't have this horrendous backstory. Like his backstory is he literally killed his wife and child because she birthed a mutant. Wouldn't it have been stronger if it was just a normal guy who is a preacher who doesn't like mutants? I was going to say, I don't think it detracts, but I don't think you needed it. I think you could have just presented him as this like as this thing he is, because that thing exists. We all know that that thing exists, and it doesn't really need a reason, right? His beliefs make him an evil man, but now it's like, no, he actually is an evil man because he's done evil things. Like, if he was just like an ignorant, horrible person, that would I mean, have been he kind fine. of is, though. Like, he, in his mind, his child was an abomination, and so he had to kill the child and the thing it came from, the thing being his wife. Yeah, but that's just, like, it's not necessary. It's just... I think, if anything, it's supposed to get you closer, like, closer to identifying with him, quote-unquote. What? How is that supposed to make you identify with him? <laughs> because just, he at least, because he at least has a motivation. Understanding, like, why he's doing, yeah, what he's doing but i think it's more relatable to, like there are xenophobic homophobic racists who would do this without having to kill their wife and child to do it and that's a stronger message than evil people do evil things you know what i mean like i, I do normal people can do evil things i do semi agree with you actually in that like i think you could easily take the like the joker approach where he doesn't like doesn't have a backstory doesn't need a backstory he just does the thing because that's what he does it was over the top for me. Fair, actually. I, like this is the one that I'm most inclined to give you of the of the ones we talked about because I, yeah, I will doesn't, take it. Doesn't feel necessary. Um, I mean, I don't mind the backstory. I always like more lore, even if the character is just like a one off sure. character. So I don't know. I don't mind it. Yeah, just it's fucking the the evil, the sin was Marcy's, not mine. It's like fuck off, man. It takes two to tango. Fifty percent yours, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. He is talking about how people are preaching evolution near the back, so maybe he doesn't buy into that. This is true. Yes, the people who say we came from apes lines, like, oh, that's not, oh, okay. All right. All right. He's telling his backstory to Scott and Aurora. He doesn't, right? so he's Aurora. not actually, I don't think, does he? I thought, I thought who he's talking to. He's thinking, he's just thinking to himself, I think. He just has this, he just has all this in his own head. I was going through it and I was like, he looks at the two X Men and blah blah blah. He thinks like he thinks back. He remembers like oh, this is yeah, all just maybe. in his head. The X Men still have no idea why he's doing what he's doing. So at least there's that. Sure, yeah. But let's talk about like Anne for a second, the uh, main purifier. Sure. Because I wish I had more background on her as like a person. I don't know. Is maybe it's just me. I, I know she's just supposed to be like a a plot device, like the lead henchman, basically. Mm-hmm. But I think, like, if given like a small background and how she became so like loyal to Striker, I thought that I thought that could have been interesting. I thought it would be like the the twist at the end that she's affected by the mutant killing ray that Xavier mm-hmm. is exuding. It would have been cooler if she was hiding that, like she was part of Striker's force, even though she knew, like, her zealotry came from her rejecting what she is, kind of thing. That would be interesting, actually. Because then especially you get like a weird interaction between them at the end, too, where like instead of her being like, hey, no, don't kill me. She's like, hey, I was trying to help you eradicate me. I don't know. That would be that would be an interesting take or an interesting way to spin it. She was cool, quote unquote. I mean, as as cool as like a terrifying assassin zealot can be. (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> Which is why I wanted to know more about her in general, I guess. Um, but speaking of which, so during this time, Anne is hunting down Kitty Pride, who uh, basically had escaped the purifiers and is running through the city. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. This is where Anne kills a lot of Latinos. <laughs> yeah. So a uh, comic book that's trying to talk about being racially sensitive has the street gang. <laughs> yeah, it sure does, Pat. <laughs> who uh, <laughs> opens with trying to rape Kitty Pride. So, uh, and one of them's wearing a turban. I just, you know, things happen. I feel like I'm not qualified to comment on that scene. Like, I feel like I should just, like, not talk about it. Well, like, I don't quite understand, because they made a whole big deal about using the N-word and how powerful that is for people of color. But then they have this scene. What are they getting at with this scene? Yeah. Like, doesn't that feel like two steps back from the one step forward we had in the beginning? Yeah, I will take that as. Uh... <laughs> I just so like I feel it. I don't know. Again, it's one of those ones where like I don't want to. I don't really want to like <laughs> trip into like, saying something I shouldn't. I feel yeah. like why are they Mexican? Why why can't they just be white gang members? You know, like I don't know. That was a choice that was made. It was a choice that was made. Well, they also just didn't need to use uh, the gang at all. No, no, you know? it's yeah, true. exactly. I guess I I, I don't want to like defend it, but like I guess the reasoning would be since Kitty is still going through this whole coming of age thing, she's still a teenager. She's out on her own, basically in the city, and this is like a non supervillain type of danger that a young woman would encounter being by herself. Basically, it's like a oh you know what if I was a young female reader reading this? Oh, I could relate to that because being in a back alley in the middle of the night in a large city too, I'm on your own to walk through new york city when it's dark out yeah in a in a novel they're trying to be progressive in it was a weird they, thing to see they took a misstep or stumble if you will sure yeah anyways they all die yeah. kitty escapes and then gets blown up Except, you know, she she phases. Phases. that phasing <laughs> comes in handy a lot, right? Turns out like you can't touch that girl. How does she not fall through the world? That's what I want to know. Uh, powers. <laughs> Science. <Cool>. Awesome. <laughs> Mumbo jumbo. So she escapes onto a uh, subway train. Yep. And a kindly cop tries to protect her from the purifiers. Oh, Isn't it refreshing how all cops do the right thing in this book? What a good fiction. All cops is. are great. <laughs> Cops are good. They will protect you, regardless of what bad guys are after you. And whether you're Magneto or not. Heck yeah. (laughs) Dude, he put the ceiling back, so it's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the X-Men beat up some purifiers. Magneto, like, rips the roof off the train, essentially. It, like, drives them through the city. Charles finds Jesus. Oh, wait, you're skipping over the fly magic carpet ride that Magneto makes? Because that's the right. best. I was going to talk the about series. it, though. <laughs> like, holy God, Magneto, you were just you could do anything. You ready for him to break out into a whole new world? <laughs> he's even sitting cross-legged. It's like, oh, my God, he's been waiting for this moment. <laughs> he's had a plan. I think in a cool Magneto sense, he does take the bullet out of the cop. Because yeah. he, he doesn't like humans. Just let the guy die. Was helping Kitty, so <laughs> she's worth saving. He's playing by the X Men's rules for now, I think. Also, yeah. that's for the right. most part, except for torturing that guy. <laughs> well, Wolverine started that, so. But yeah, Xavier totally buys into the the brainwashing at that point. You know what's funny is that I, when I was looking at uh, Xavier in this uh, sequence here, yeah, I kept going back to that Star Trek episode with Picard, who plays Xavier in the movies. When there's only three lights, you there know, are he's like, four lights. Four, yeah. it is very much the yes. same thing, actually. Yeah, it's very much the same thing, and neither of them quite gives in. Well, Xavier gives in, just you know, I mean, he doesn't, doesn't kill totally Scott kill. and Aurora, so that's good. It's I mean, plus, barely doesn't kill Scott and Aurora. Yeah, that's the same as not killing them. They got a lot of blood coming out of the nose later on. Scott's completely prepared to kill, kill Charles, so I mean, like. Yeah, not that out of him. But the, I mean, okay, at the time, at the time, or when I read this when I was a kid in like the early 90s, this was like a really interesting thing to see because Professor X was always the dad, you know? Mm-hmm. And to like watch him 
basically murder, even though you knew it's like through comic book magic, they would still live, uh, basically murder his children. That was like a major event back then. It, it's yeah. not it's not like today where a character will die and then they'll be revived like 10 you know 10 issues later no but especially like as a like as a younger reader too and like i don't know if you felt the same way bryce but like xavier to me coming off the x-men cartoon felt like the guy who always like usually has everything figured out like he's the grown-up in the room right so for him yeah, to exactly. like be turned in this way and like made to do these things i i would guess would probably be kind of shocking if you were reading it as a younger mm-hmm. reader. Which, going back to Star Trek, when Picard turns into Locutus. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. They're the same Xavier, person. Xavier and Picard are the same. Broly was born to play. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he kills people. It's real sad. Doesn't quite kill people, though, so it's not quite that sad. <laughs> we don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. Nightcrawler We're threatens gonna... that dude. I'm going to bite you, because that's my the, mutant uh, powers. Bite what, people. Doctor, scientist guy that created the uh, other Cerebro? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're going to wheel the dead bodies to the basement, and they're like, oh, wait, no, we're going up. But uh, instead, Magneto throws an elevator on top of the the <laughs> Twin Towers. It's the, it's the Wonkavator. Watch out. And then Wolverine's like, wait, they're not totally dead. I'm like, oh, my God, let me shock them, because I'm Magneto. And I know how to, electricity. Uh, I have electricity powers. Because magnets. So this actually is like the most interesting sequence in the book to me is the sequence where Magneto's talking about his like his version of the dream essentially, where like mutants have kind of taken over the world, and at the same time mm-hmm. they're like, he's like, humanity can exist, like, and they'll be free of hunger and stuff. And Cyclops is like, sure, you could do that, like, while you're alive, which is an assumption, but okay. <laughs> and he's like, who's gonna do that after you're gone? And Magneto's like. Obviously you, Scott. <laughs> Obviously it's yeah. you. Like that's such Scott, it's you. That's, I need you. That's such a cool take from Magneto of like, yeah, you guys, you're gonna be on my side. You're gonna realize one day that I'm right. Me, Magneto. Which again is super interesting feeding into the X-Men stuff that's going on right now, where everyone's all joined up and like Cyclops is basically the lieutenant of Xavier and Magneto as like a super dad team. So mm. I don't know. I really like that passage where magneto is just so convinced he's right that he is convinced that eventually the x-men will be the people who carry on his legacy and not charles's i got major dr doom vibes from this oh yeah for sure description of his utopia like they won't care what things are totalitarian estate that i build because all their whims will be catered to they won't care it'll be fine utopia all for the low low cost of freedom yeah, but if you have no wants, who cares about freedom? Well, I mean, you're not you're not not selling me here, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not not selling you. You're not not selling me. But yeah, I like so like there are a couple sequences in this that I really like, and I think but I think as far as like dialogue and like the ideas behind it, this might actually be my like my favorite because to me it's kind of the most interesting. Because Magneto's interesting and like the like how confident he is is super cool. Magnus, man. It's all about that confidence. He's all that and a bag of potato chips. <laughs> so now Stryker's talking. He's saying things I disagree with. <laughs> he's he's getting real... Uh, he's getting very preachy. So many people in the comic are like, hey, he's not... Like, this is what he's saying is not good. That even just seeing what Mercy or whatever, Mercy, whatever his name is, be like, the president's a fair-minded yes. man. He believes the res- reverend's view is deserve a hearing. I was like, that's the real world. That's how it actually goes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So the deep shadows on Stryker's face throughout this sequence, like, I don't know, I think they help add to the the gravity of the situation. I think the choice to just, like, put him behind, like, in front of an all-black background, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that basically all you see is him and the words he's saying. Because, like, that's all he is, right? Is he's a dude and an ideology. He's not a fancy-schmancy mutant. He doesn't have powers. He's not out here punching Cyclops in the face. Like, he's a dude and he's got ideas. And that's all you see Mm -hmm. in the, the panels on that page where he starts speaking. Yeah. And he's not like doing some crazy, like psionics or like metal bending, but he's just as threatening or more so than Magneto or Xavier. Yeah. He's probably like, honestly, one of the most dangerous villains the X-Men have faced. Right. He's doing a stand at a microphone. His words, his words. I mean, which is what Cyclops says later too. And like, what is one of my new favorite Cyclops moments of all time? (laughs) Isn't that list getting a little full, Matt? Come on. It's not, actually. 
you can't have too full of a list of favorite Cyclops moments because that guy's <laughs> so good. Uh, but then Stryker enacts his evil plan and switches Xavier's death mind rays on, and an innocent Star Wars fan falls to the ground outside the stadium. No, Star Wars. Fan. Well, I mean, he hadn't even seen Return of the Jedi yet. It's the best one. No, <laughs> no it's not though. Are we gonna have more movie fights on this episode? Wait, what's the best Star Wars? Empire. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> All right, Bryce, get us back on track. Come Magneto, on. So, he's busted into the UN. Or Madison Square Garden. Is it the Square Garden? Uh, oh, yeah. no. I've had a skewed view of the story the whole I like, time. I like that they actually really included ABC News and, and like, ABC CBS. ABC News everywhere. Like, you know, instead of, like, making up some phony, like, news station. Well, it's the thing. Like, it's real people, real places. Like, this is squarely set in New York. I think that's part of why the Danger Room sequence looks so weird to me in context of this book. Because everywhere else is a real place in the real world. And that's a box with a robot in it. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, that's to separate the comic book from this real gritty story that's it, about to It be could told. actually be. You could be right, for sure. But don't worry, guys. Oh, God, that's my favorite bit. Senator, we've got to get out of here. No, damn it. See? Magneto's replaced <laughs> the, the roof. Who is new? I like that. <laughs> He's made an entrance, not an attack. Ab- oh, above God. that that speech bubble you're fixated on is probably my like my favorite panel of the comic, where Magneto's just screaming Striker in like Stryker! all caps 80s letters. And like it's probably my it's probably my favorite visual panel of the comic. <laughs> the thing you take away from the page is that guy talking about it's the hilarious room. because you've got that really dramatic panel with striker and the roof of the building is literally being lifted up and the center's like whoa he put it back it's just an entrance it's fine. Fine. he's just here to talk he put the roof back i mean only just this <laughs> guy that's tried to take over the world like a dozen times it's gonna he's, be taken o- he's tried to take over the world <laughs> many less times at this point than i think you're used to bryce he hasn't killed a bunch of people in new york yet he put, this, he put the roof back, okay, Bryce? He's, <laughs> he's very, Let the man speak. Right? Very polite individual. Oh, and then Striker's like, Xavier, blast him. And Xavier blasts him. And he's like, well, I can't take one more of those. That was a lot. What did you guys think about the senator who's been like, uh, Striker's really weird, but we got to hear him out, is a mutant? Like, what do you think about that choice? I didn't realize it was Senator Kelly. I just re- thought it was some rando senator. No, it's Senator Kelly. Oh, okay. It's Kelly? Yeah. Oh, my God. So it's both the first X-Men movie and the second X-Men movie? Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> I'm going to need you to prove this to me, Bryce. I see no name next to this senator. He's always just called Senator. And I thought Senator Kelly had glasses, but I could be confusing him with someone else. <laughs> well, there's like the 90s cartoon version of him. All right. I choose to believe you until I look it until I look it up on Wikipedia later and slam you in the show notes. Gotcha, Bryce. Right, exactly. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. But yeah, he's he's a mutant. It's like, oh, well, that's a shame. A man in power who was sort of siding with the mutants is now a mutant himself. I mean, it's probably good. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. Of like, it would have been nice if he. It's the same thing like, with like Senator or not Senator Kelly with a uh, striker, right? Whereas like he doesn't need to have this additional layer. Well, it'd be more powerful. If it was like a human, like, no mutants are one of us, but no, it's a, his actions are now tinged with, is this self? Yeah. Is it just, is because, for his is own it just because he's a mutant? Cause if this keeps going forward, he, his life is in danger as well. Cause if it was just a, a human Senator saying, no mutants are, are normal people. We got to protect them just like everyone else. That would be more powerful. Yeah, I kind of agree. Yeah. But at the same time, it's kind of like a cool reveal that he is a mutant. It's very comic booky. Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. yeah, it is. Does it sort of weaken uh, Purifier Anne's twist at the end, though? Like, it's like, oh, the senator is a mutant. Next page. Anne's, Anne's a, mutant. a mutant. A little bit, yeah, I think. Like, and plus the senator being a mutant doesn't really do anything for the rest of the series or no. the, the story. Other than giving that awesome part of X Men One, where Senator Kelly turns into a jellyfish and then explodes, right. still not confirmed that this is Senator Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> New head cannon. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, backstage, Cyclops and the rest of the X Men are saving Xavier. Cyclops is going to kill that boy. <laughs> he doesn't care. I love Cyclops. Is He's so good. Be- he wouldn't. He knows that the situation has to be contained and he knows how powerful Xavier is and he's willing to do whatever he has to do. I think he probably prefers that he didn't kill him, 
But like he, if Wolverine had killed him, I don't think Cyclops would have been angry. Well, he would have been angry, but not because Wolverine killed him. Hmm. I don't. I don't know if their plan was ever to kill them, though. I mean, Wolverine says, "Psych, your Zap KO'd him. My claws would have killed." And Cyclops says, "I know," as he's wrecking the entire machine with his optic blast. Oh, Cyclops! What a badass! What a good guy that Cyclops. <laughs> can we? Can you just explain the whole Cyclops? beams aren't energy they're physical force is this wait wait wait! don't tell me i'm going to say this things that i think i know okay it his eye beams open up a dimension into a oh, reality boy. of physical force <laughs> and the physical force comes out of his eyes pat wow you you've gone deep into the lore on this one <laughs> This is what I know. This is what I know to be true. So don't tell me it's not true. You're technically right, I think. Although I think most people prefer to pretend that that's mm-hmm. not a thing. No, no, no. Because in this panel I'm looking at right now, his eye beams are physically knocking Xavier out. It doesn't like slice through him or anything. It punches him in the jaw. Oh, yeah, hard it's, enough de- it's, it's definitely it. optic force, not like heat vision or whatever. No matter what Gail Simone will tell you on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna melt anything. It'll blow holes in walls. It, it's like, like you're that. getting punched by Cyclops' eyes mm-hmm. real hard. Because his eyes open up a portal to a dimension of, of physical force. It's a punch dimension, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> awesome. Moving on. You're you're correct. <laughs> good, 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 but, good. Yes. But in a way that no one likes to reference. No, that's the Cyclops I prefer. I prefer oh. that much more. No, I prefer the Cyclops that's dramatically standing here, shadows on his face, saying, I'm not running. And that's the word balloon. That's my Cyclops. That boy's going to stand up in Madison Square Garden and shove this preacher down. Not, not the one that says one way or the other, us or him, it ends tonight. That's a little over the top, Pat. I'll give you that one. You're two for, two for four <laughs> at least. Come on, Pat. You got chills when he said, I'm not running. You can admit it. You've, you're a Cyclops fanboy now. I understand. Join us. Mm. Join, join my club. Mm. There are three nope. of us. Nope, nope, nope. Oh, Cyclops is so good, though, Pat. No, he's really not. He's, he's really not. He's very broody. Yes. Nope, nope, nope. No one gets me, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why you and Cyclops are... Uh... That's why we get along, <laughs> yes. I think so, actually. <laughs> Oh, okay. Wait, so I, I did do some digging, and it is just an unknown. Yeah. So you win, Matt. Oh. But I swear, like, Merce was used as a character for other things. Maybe it's in the cartoon. That's I don't possible. know. But I swear I've heard that name, like, a bunch of places. That I just don't get to roast you in the show notes now, though, Bryce. <laughs> 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 Took that from him. So, yeah, Xavier gets chalked. That's the sound effect, right? Chalk? Yeah, I'm not, chalk. not quite sure. That's I, I would prefer an N sound to be in there, too, like a chonk. A chonk. Or like a zap or something. No, zap's too lasery because you got to get that it's a physical beam coming yeah, out of the physical beam realm. Yeah, it's not a laser. It's not heat vision. It's just yeah. a punch from the punch dimension. But I feel like chonk isn't the right. Or sorry, chalk. Chalk is like it needs an mm or like a mm sound. But anyways, I, I digress. Uh, they're standing up to Striker because Cyclops got his big boy pants on today. Cyclops always has his big boy. Well, he doesn't always have his big boy pants on. <laughs> One time he lost a fight to Storm. He was real mad about it for a long time. <laughs> Classic Cyclops. Well, she's got the range on him. She was powerless at the time, actually. That sounds about right, though. That sounds about right. So Cyclops uses his most powerful mutant ability, talking, to talk down Striker. Well, not really. <laughs> Doesn't no, really but he tries. About. He tries. You do get what is probably the like one of the most iconic X Men panels, where Striker's pointing at Nightcrawler and saying, "You dare call that thing human?" To be fair, Nightcrawler is like he could straighten up a little bit. He's he's, he, he's, he's hunched. hunched. He's that is kind of a sad pose. It's like like he could straighten up there. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, can we go over what Cyclops says real quick? Because I've sort of got an issue with one of the things he's saying. Yeah, let me turn the light on in my room quick so I can see the words. It's in the getting comic. dark, it's getting dark here. It's getting dark. <laughs> All right, perfect. Continue. Fantastic. Uh, so it starts with a good, it's a strong start. Yeah. What makes your link with heaven any stronger than mine? That's a good start. That's a good line. I like that line a lot. Then it goes into, we have unique gifts, but no more so and no more special than those granted a physician or 
a physicist or a philosopher or athlete. It could be due to an accident or nature or divine providence. Who is to say? That is bullshit. Okay, Pat, I counter with this. Could you, that is play, complete could you play in the NBA? Because I could. Matt, Matt, Magneto may have put the ceiling back on, but he had to take the ceiling off first. All Any right? carpenter could do that, Pat. Matt, <laughs> Xavier was about to kill all mutants <laughs> in the world. Any... Uh-huh, yeah. I mean, like, any army could do that, Pat. Mm-hmm, an army of how many thousands of... A physicist humans? can make an atom bomb. That's all it uh-huh. is, Pat. Okay, yes. So this is my problem. I get what X-Men are going for. Obviously, people should be treated the same regardless of their Whether they can or... shoot punches out of their eyes from the punch dimension? I agree, Pat. But there are some legitimately <laughs> terrifying mutants out there. Like who? <laughs> name three. Name name the top five. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I like the allegory of using X Men for minorities and and their rights. That's great. I'm all for it. But does it somewhat break down at some point when they are like godlike beings that can crush the entire human race with a like stray thought? My answer is yes, but it's comic books. In all in all seriousness, like, <laughs> okay, it's the same. It's the same thing where you've got to like hand wave Batman not having killed the Joker by now. Like you got to like you hand wave. Oh hey, yeah, that dude could collapse his entire building on us if he wanted to, but he put the roof back. It's fine. <laughs> he put it, he put it back. Calm down. Well, yeah, I guess like the thing is, is like. Yeah, you have these powers, and it's up to the individual to use them for good or for Just evil. like a physicist, totally you know, or Michael Jordan, yeah, or a very skilled typist, or, yeah. <laughs> it's just like reality warping mutants ex- exist. Okay, so here's the deal: how like Cyclops is not yeah. more dangerous than William Stryker in this story, right? Like, and he's just sure, a dude; yeah, he's just okay. a normal dude. He's an old white dude. <laughs> so, like, in that case, I would think, like. Yeah, Cyclops' argument is fine. Cyclops isn't the one who tried to turn, like, a mind bomb on the entire mutant population of New York in this story. He's no he's no less dangerous than the guy he's arguing with. What is that mind bomb using to become a mind bomb? If it wasn't a mind bomb, it could have just been an atom bomb or something, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Guy's got his own building. He could build an atom bomb. I have read the short stories where, like, a kid's mutant power to activate, and his power is to disintegrate people within like fifteen mile radius of him. <laughs> or you know, like Frank, like Franklin uh, Richards, you know, can just change reality some, whenever he wants. Yeah, like some mutants can just bend reality however they want. It's yeah, the like, same. It's the same as being able to skateboard really well. <laughs> Have you seen an NBA player do a really good layup to the... I mean, it's, That's it's the right. same as sending the entirety of the Avengers into a pocket dimension. I don't get the difference. An astronaut calculating the orbit around the moon perfectly. I mean, come on. I, like, <laughs> it's exactly the same as being able to turn your body into diamond. I don't understand I, why you're stuck on this. I don't, I don't think there should be like death squads. I obviously think that's a huge overstep, but there should be some sort of like, I don't know. No, I mean, I don't want to, in, in all like, seriousness, my answer is yes, but it's comic books. And I think also as you get further on from this story, a lot of writers actually do start dealing with that. Like I think the Morrison stuff touches on that. A good amount actually sure and like the hickman stuff's definitely touching on that a good amount to the point where like the mutants are providing miracle drug yeah, cures to yeah. the rest of the world at this point and like making them dependent on mutants and that's how they get to have their own nation <laughs> so like yes it's a thing it's a it's a weird dichotomy like i love the message the x-men send but at the same time if you think about it too hard it's weird <laughs> All right, so yeah, the X-Men are supposed to be, like, feared because they're born a certain way, and they eventually get these, like, powers, which, if you were, like, an Avenger, they would be superpowers, and everyone would look up to you, but because you're just born that way, everyone just automatically hates you. And that, and that like, has never, like, made sense to me, because it's, like, they could be Avengers, you know, the Avengers could be mutants, I don't know, it doesn't really matter, they're all superpowered beings. So I always, I always thought that was weird, uh, like the X Men being in the Marvel universe. 
right? Like yeah. you're not terrified of the literal Norse god of thunder, but a, a guy who who looks a little like a guy who has blue skin. Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a freak. Oh. Like why isn't Stryker going after them as well? But I mean, I guess like later on, isn't there like a storyline arc with like the um, superhero registration act in general? Yeah, and before that, the mutants are already basically like living in essentially an internment yeah. cab to the point where when Tony Stark comes to Emma Frost and is like, hey, help me out with this. Emma's like, where were you when they killed like 16 million <laughs> mutants in Genosha, bro? <laughs> Go away. <laughs> so I guess it does eventually happen. Yeah. Yeah, it gets it gets dealt with more and more as kind of like in this book, in this book, there's like 20 mutants total in the world basically is like the presumed thing. Like it's a small mm-hmm. number as writers continue to up that and also like the fact that it's not just Magneto that could actually threaten the world. It's like a bunch of mutants that can bend reality or like invent whatever they want, which I don't understand how that's a mutant power still. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. Like, but like even in this issue, Xavier thinks real hard and is about to genocide an entire race. Like, that's that's scary. Just within like, like a he, block of the Madison Square Garden, it seems. Is like. it a block? Okay. I, I well, think yes. Innocent Star Wars fans were hurt. I am not okay There's, with that. Pat, Pat, can I be real with you? Yeah. There's no such thing as. Yeah, I was gonna Star say Wars. as a Star Trek fan, I am okay with that. <laughs> uh, okay, so anyways, I was gonna say the ending of this book, which is actually very powerful, I think. Stryker pulls out a gun, points it at a 15 year old girl. Yeah, basically gets shot by. One of the cops standing by. All of the X Men stand and stare while he does so. No one. Okay, reacting. you know why, Pat? He's pointing what? a gun at Kitty Pride. <laughs> Doesn't matter. She's just gonna phase. Exactly. Well, that's true. But they're trying to make a point, you know, like because if they like attacked Striker, then they would make him a martyr. But yeah, then the cops like, no, I won't allow you to do this, and he shoots. It's the classic blam. Where did that blam come from? Yeah, oh, not that gun. A different gun. That other gun. Yeah, I was gonna say I think it was the sequence was drawn out really well. Yeah, yeah no, I agree. I do like the other cop too, who wishes the X Men good luck because he knows they'll need it. It's like, I'm not a mutant hater, but goodness knows there's a whole bunch of women in this room <laughs> that could do more right. awful things to me. <laughs> in, the, in the fiction of this universe, the cops are all pretty good. So every cop, <laughs> every single one. Uh, and then yeah, the epilogue where Xavier's like. Damn, Magneto, maybe you're right. Maybe maybe we should kill all those humans. And who convinces him that Magneto's not right? Your boy. Uh, I don't know. I didn't catch that. You didn't... Oh, you might have missed the, the red sunglasses. Oh. That's Scott. I don't know if you... Oh, is that Scott? Yeah, it's Scott. <laughs> oh, I thought that was Hank McCoy. Oh, mm. see, they look yeah. very alike. So. They do. <laughs> so. The glasses. <laughs> Throws me every time. I know. Uh, Yeah, so like... Scott gets preachy at the end. And to get Scott to stop talking, Xavier's like, fine, goddamn. I'll, I won't so I will have you know, I read, I read Bryce's notes that he actually managed to type up online <laughs> before this. Well, the only one of the three of us. Thanks, Bryce. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bryce, you're the best. And he said that he liked Scott's speech at the end. <gasps> Bryce, you didn't. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to find the line. Hold on. It was something about them being like a different branch of the same tree. <laughs> but don't you see either of you we're oh, humans yeah. too that one yeah keep going pat uh, <clears throat> a different branch perhaps but the same basic tree such a fundamental shift in attitude can't be imposed to have any meaning it must grow from within yeah <laughs> <laughs> bryce what about that did you did okay you find I, I mean I, I swear to god that's exactly how xavier reacted to it <laughs> it was like sure yeah okay. well i was thinking oh, more right. of like um, i guess i can't give up yet i was thinking more of, <laughs> more from like uh chris claremont's perspective not necessarily like cyclops speaking this you know just from like a writing perspective like it's true if you want like lasting change to happen within the society it's got to be slow and it's got to be done through like education uh, I, 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 was, I was looking at it from the actual writer's point of view Sure. What's that like slightly made up number? It's like once 25% of society believes the thing, like eventually it'll like it'll take root. Oh, I don't know about that, but something like that. I mean, that's a completely made up number, I'm sure, but like that's kind of what it made me think of. I know what you're thinking. Yeah. Uh, whereas like Magneto just like wants to just take over the world, get it like all done. 
and basically force change on people, which then people are going to resent said change. Not if they're fed and clothed well. That's his. Yeah. That's his. Well, if, what if they aren't well, hungry? They, they right. become like the adults that. from Wally. I mean, <laughs> get to float around in our chairs. I need me my chair. Yeah. So Magneto glides away into the night. Yeah, they almost touched hands. It's true. <laughs> like their love was almost, almost consummated, <laughs> but denied at the end. In three years, Magneto will be teaching at the X Men school. By the way. Yeah, that's <laughs> at this true. Point. That's true. Yeah. He's coming around. And then Kirk gives him a hanky. Oh, Nightcrawler, yeah. you're the best. And then, like, I thought, like, Storm and Cyclops were sharing a kiss outside. But... They have a thing. There's, like, a, they're good they're friends. Very they're good friends, good, man. good friends. Very good friends. I wish Storm did more in this. I'm just going to say, she really doesn't do much. Well, I mean, none of them really do much, in my opinion. <laughs> Kitty so gets Magneto, to do stuff. Say, well, no, Magneto and Kitty are the two center characters. I was going to say, Magneto, Kitty, and Cyclops, honestly, Cyclops are the gets, standouts for me. Gets to monologue a few times. I mean, come on. But yeah, like Storm, Colossus are pretty much on the sidelines. Colossus gets to do Colossus things. He does rip that engine out of that car. It's yeah. true. It's true. But yeah, I would say of the people, Storm gets by far the least amount of stuff to do. She gets the last line of the book, at least. Are they hinting at a romantic thing at the end there? No, they're just friends, man. They're leader of the X-Men okay. buddies. They're the only ones who understand how heavy is the head that wears the X-Crown. <laughs> okay. All right. yeah. He goes on to lead Blue, and she re- leads the gold team. That was that book. It's a good book. Yeah. I think I think it's a good book to give to someone yeah, who's new to the X-Men and be like, this is pretty much what they're about. Pat, what book would you give someone instead? Because I feel like you want to contest this statement. I do, but I don't have the knowledge necessary to do so. I mean, from so the stuff you've read. Stuff. Just off the top of your head. Yeah. I'd have to reread Days of Futures Past to see how complex that story is. That story's got time well, to say, that's, that's too complex for, for new people. That story's got French yeah. Richards in it. I'd just start them start them off with X-Men number one from 1963. <laughs> no. There we go. I've read that and it's not gonna it's not gonna make you read more X-Men comics. <laughs> I liked it. It's fine. It was very pure. It was a very pure story. It it is fine, but like it's not it's not X-Men X-Men. Like the concept has not yeah. been refined at that point. E is for it's evolution. A, let's let's just get it out there. It's for extinction, I think, X-Men. isn't it? Ex- oh, extinction. you're right. Sorry, yes. E is for extinction. No, you, see, you shouldn't have told him that. Then you could have roasted him in the notes. <laughs> no. Pat, no. I have to deal with Pat every month. I can't roast him in the show notes. <laughs> There's enough time between recordings that you'll forget. <laughs> I will take my roasting live and in person. Thank you. Gosh. I don't know. Like This is this is a civic lesson version of the X-Men, which is definitely It is the a power. version of the X-Men, but it's not the only yeah. version. I'll give you that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't I haven't read enough. I'm showing the fact that I've, I'm more of an X Men movie fan than I am in comic books, and it <laughs> shames fine. me. It well, shames me. It's fine. I haven't read any of the recent X Men stuff, like basically since 2005 onwards. Bryce, you're you are in the majority of the comic reading public. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, like no one's been as excited for the X Men as they have been in the past like four months since probably the 90s. Oh man. They brought Jubilee back? Is that what me? Not yet, but I'm sure soon, yes. <laughs> well, she's back as a vampire, right? I don't know if she is a vampire oh anymore. God. I think they might have cured her of her vampirism. Uh, well, that's nice. And she has, like, because a baby. She does have a baby. A vampire baby? I don't think so. <laughs> oh, my God. Did a werewolf imprint on it? Because that's never good. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't gone full Twilight quite yet in the X-Men <laughs> comics. And Buffy's not in the I mean, she... so. She definitely sparkles in the sun, though, right? Because get it, Jubilee? Okay. All she right. always sparkles. <laughs> it's the joke. No, it's a good joke. I liked the story. I think it's a powerful one, and I think it does serve a purpose beyond a comic book, which is great. I think it's a product of its time, though, and you can definitely tell when reading it. Well, they could write something similar for today, I feel like. But it would be... Sure. I don't know if it would use such a religious like context... I don't know if you could actually, just in the fact that like the X Men as a concept have pro- like progressed so far to the point where like all the mutants are living together on their own island mm-hmm. nation in the middle of the ocean now. Like, can you just drop the X Men in the middle oh, of well, Times Square like, like this? I don't I mean, know. If if you were to like start a series like with a whole different team, you know, 
Yeah. I mean, comics are really good at hitting the reset button, so I, yeah. I would imagine you could do it. Well, this wasn't in continuity, right? This is its own standalone. Technically, thing. no, like it wasn't, but I'm pretty sure it is because, like, the purifiers are an ongoing concern I think after this. They oh. it joins people were able to put it in the continuity with uh in like around 2001 when this like certain when they tried to do God, God loves man kills part two, oh, and all the way in 2001, and then they and then they that's when they tied it all in together. Do we have rec- comics to recommend? Yeah, E is for Extinction. Do it. Yeah, I was gonna say E for Extinction is really good. Yeah, I think you could like straight up hop from this into that. You could read the Whedon stuff if you want. That stuff's more straightforward, superhero-y, Although there's mm-hmm. good stuff. There's really good Cyclops stuff in that Whedon. Stuff. I mean, I mean honestly, art. you could jump jump directly to Days of Future Past from this. Like once you've got your toes wet. Yeah, like once you have your bearings again. and you've like definitely gotten a good sense of who Kitty is because Kitty like carries Days of Future Past also actually. Yeah, I think this is a very similar like feel to Days of Future Past. Like it takes the purifiers and like turns them into giant <laughs> mutant killing robots. Yeah, which you know like makes it more, more comic booky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you could definitely jump into Days of Future Past from this. I do think for us who have all like read some amount of X-Men comics, it's going to be pretty, pretty cool to jump into House of X and Powers of X having just read this and like watch like what, like what a difference 30 years has done to the X-Men. Cause like, it's wild, you guys. I'm so pumped. I know I've been like, I've been in our discord just be like House of X and Powers of X is great. And someone's <laughs> reading it with us for the podcast. Cause I need to talk about it. I'm there for it. Yeah. We, <laughs> we need to read House of X powers of X as a podcast. Yeah. I'm down. Sweet. All right, I think that's going to do it for this month's discussion of X-Men, God Loves, Man Kills. As always, if you want to get in touch with Pat or me, you can find us on Twitter as at the Hypnotoad and at Matt Ledge, respectively. You can also email us at waitingonthetrade at gmail.com and read more comics-related goodness at mattreadscomics.com. Bryce, where can people find you online, assuming that you want to be found? <laughs> uh, just like last time, I guess League of Legends or, yeah. <laughs> just message one of these guys and then they'll get it i was gonna say if you need to, if you need to tell bryce how right he is about everything he said on the podcast just let us know at one of our places and we'll yeah, let him we're know. wrong i was gonna give you the benefit of the doubt bryce <laughs> either way thanks for being here bryce yeah i love talking it's a good suggestion i'm haven't had not read this book before and i am glad that i did now yeah and i have plenty of other suggestions <laughs> besides x-men x-men stuff <laughs> Cool. But first, we got to read more X Men stuff. Yeah, that's that's also good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again to Bryce for coming on to talk X Men with us. Join us next month when guest host Tyler Mrifke stops by to talk Ghost Rider: The Last Stand. <laughs>